Greetings and welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Very happy to have a fascinating guest on my program this week. This is Christian Van Heist, a commercial airline pilot captain, flies 747s around the world. Uh, Christian Van Heist has been flying professionally for more than 20 years now, uh, or about 20 years, I think. Was a first officer about 20 years ago for a Fokker 50 turboprop flying all over Europe. He flew for multiple African airlines and as a military contractor in Afghanistan. A few years after that, he moved up to Boeing 737s flying all over Europe, uh, then moves on to Boeing 747s, uh, which he's been flying for over 12 years now. He has seen much of the world. Uh, probably all of the world and <laughs> destinations and landscapes from that flight deck. And he is now a captain who flies 747s. He's got over 9,500 hours of flight time, over 6,000 hours on the Boeing 747. Uh, the other thing about uh, Christian Van Heys is he has become very well known for his aerial photography. This has been reproduced widely on online and in print. Uh, we're talking CNN, BBC, Times, Daily Mail, National Geographic, many, many other organizations have reproduced his photographs. Um, fascinating. And uh, of late, he's been having a lot to say about the UAP slash UFO phenomenon. I have links for Christian below, including his Twitter feed, his Instagram website, and some books. We can talk about that as well. But Without any further ado, let me introduce or let me welcome Christian. Welcome to the program. Well, thanks so much. That's quite an introduction. <laughs> Appreciate it. I'm just looking at the bio, man, but it's a good bio. And um, uh, it is quite fascinating. I mean, I'll just say, you know, com you know, my interest is in UFOs, or now we say UAP. And one uh, significant element of this phenomenon for 80 plus years has been its interaction with commercial airline pilots. This goes back through the 1940s and 50s, uh, something that uh, UFO historians are quite interested in. This is a big thing. And so we're, I think we're always interested whenever a new commercial pilot cares to speak out on this subject, because as we know, there's, there's activity going on up there. A lot of it is explainable, as you yourself has said, but some of it is maybe not so explainable. And I'll be interested in asking you not only about your own experiences and photographs, which we're going to look at a number of them here, but also your sense of perhaps the commercial airline culture on UFOs to the extent that you can talk about it. I might, I think listeners would be interested in what you have to say about that. But perhaps we can just start with where you started with all of this. Uh, I know you have an interest in photography and how did your interest in UFOs or UAP get kickstarted uh, in connection with being a pilot? Um, yeah, well, that's that's a, that's, a, that's a good question to start with. Uh, maybe it's nice to to know for the the viewers that my photography literally started together with my flying career. Um, ever since my first flight as a as a as a student pilot, I was just so amazed with the beautiful views outside, and I really wanted to document it because it was like it, it, it's it's literally unique, and we're we're the third generation of human beings ever existed who can actually fly and see the world from above. So for me, it was almost like a, a, an, an urge to document everything that I see because it's just so so unique and so so special. So in the last 20 years of flying, my, my photography has, has evolved as well. Uh, once I started flying bigger airplanes, uh, the camera became bigger as well, and I'm able to capture more and more stuff. Um, I must say, honestly, I was never really that interested in the uh, UAP, the UFO topic, mainly because in Europe it's it's not as uh, as popular as in the United States. And in general, most of the big, uh, let's say, players and most of the people talking about UFOs in mainstream media were being portrayed as... as um, uh, Let's say uh, uh, <laughs> almost almost people um, treating the UFO topic like, like a religion, and there's such a huge stigma because of this 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 uh, portrayal in the mainstream media that I simply never really took it serious. It was only after uh, basically the interviews I saw with Commander David Traver and Lieutenant Ryan Graves 
that I realized that uh, there might be more to it. Of course, I was kind of uh, shocked to see the uh, 2017 article in the New York Times as well, where the DOD admitted that uh, there were basically objects that they couldn't identify. But as I said, it was only after I saw the interview with Commander David Traver, I think it was Joe Rogan, uh, that really opened up my eyes. And uh, since then, I started to look more into the whole topic. Also, because um, it was actually for the first time, I think it was end of 2020, that I realized that the stuff that Commander David Traver was talking about um, was kind of similar to stuff that I've seen in the earlier years of my career. And uh, that really opened up my eyes. And I basically decided, you know what, I'm going to dive into this into this UAP UFO topic and I'm going to debunk it and I'm going to find out what I've seen and that's the end of it. And now I'm sitting here because I realize actually there's 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 much more going on than just uh, strange lights moving in the sky. Fortunately, since um, since my since my uh, my earlier days as a pilot, I always made notes both in my logbook and my private notes of stuff, the interesting stuff that I've seen. Also, because I want to document later on with with pictures I post online where it was taken, what altitude I was flying, etc. And this became like a, a document that that grew over the years. And I also noted down some of the let's say strange lights and other stuff I've seen that I couldn't identify. And it's only now in retrospect that I realize how important this this uh, lock keeping actually was because I have seen a couple of things especially in the first three four five years of my flying career um, that are that that are still defying an explanation and I I think they actually qualify as, as UAP mm -hmm. so yeah uh, here I am it's uh, the last time I saw let's say an official UAP was in 2010 so that's over 13 years ago um, but still we're here and I've, I've never seen anything since so almost 10,000 hours of flying and in 10,000 hours of flying I've seen some stuff that that's that I can honestly say as a commercial pilot was was unique yeah fascinating one thing I, I've just noticed when you're talking about your interest in this subject how it was triggered by uh, Commander David Fravor which I think probably has happened for many people and also the the uh, publicity starting in 2017 you commented on and I'll just point out to people in uh, who are really doggedly following the UFO UAP subject uh, some of whom have been very critical of what they consider to be disinformation coming out of the New York Times on this. And look, there's a lot of disinformation that's come out of the New York Times. But these articles, I think it, it must be said, have triggered a large number of other people like yourself to, to feel confident about coming forward with their interest in UFOs or UAP. And this is having, I think it's a, it's a significant cultural effect. And I think you're just one example of that. So, um, yeah, your your sightings are interesting. We've got I have some images, and I wonder if we can discuss some of these. Uh, I have here ready uh, your your earliest ones. I think they're from two thousand five or so, if I'm not mistaken. And these are not your actual photographs because you were not taking photographs at that time. Is that correct? Yeah, it happened so incredibly fast that it was it was gone yeah. within one or two seconds. So I, I basically recreated the scene so people can have an idea of what the what what it looked like from my point of view. Can I show these images here? May I show? This is one sure. artist's recreation. This is over the Adriatic Sea, and I wonder if you might be able to speak to this one. I think this is your first one. Is that? No, this is I think the the third one I've seen, but uh, oh. that that doesn't really matter. This was taken. Uh, okay. Uh, this was taken while flying a 737. Uh, I must say, I just used a random scene. Actually, it's the island of Santorini over there. Uh, it's over Greece. Uh, but it, it shows the angle and it shows the relative bearing towards uh, the, the flight path we had. That all of a sudden, it was it was a clear day, just like here. There were no clouds, just um, uh, around noon or, or, or 1 p.m. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, both my colleague and I, we saw a really, really bright light. It, it's impossible to say how big it was, but a, a bright white light falling vertically down into the Adriatic Sea. This was um, just, uh, let's say, on the border between Greece and Albania. And that's kind of strange because, um, uh, well, if, to give you an example, most, most commercial pilots, when we see something that we cannot explain, the go-to answer is always, well, it must be something military because we don't know what kind of uh, expensive toys the military is using. So also in this case, the go-to answer was, well, it's probably something military happening there. But it was so strange because there was no closed airspace and it was almost exactly on the border between two countries. So I decided to ask the air traffic control, well, is there any military activity going on? Because 
we as pilots, we always have, have the flight safety aspect in mind. And immediately, yeah, immediately the air traffic controller said, no, no, there's nothing going on. Just contact the other guy and uh, goodbye. And that really struck me because I realized, first of all, uh, it was a strange location. Um, second of all, uh, the air traffic controller really dismissed it. He says there's nothing going on. And third of all, it was just a really, really strange uh, sight. It was a it was a bright light, so I have no clue if it was a solid object. And it was falling so fast, it seemed to be moving. Actually, it was it was not in a free fall like you would normally expect. Hmm. Uh, the upper limit where it originated, I have no clue because we could only see it passing through the uh, let's say when it came into view from the window frame. So the, the upper window frame was the moment that we could that we could see it, uh, and it dropped down from. Now let's say uh, thirty thousand feet to sea level uh, within a second, or maybe maybe even less than a second. Yes, um, I think I I recall you discussing this, and I try to do my own calculation of that. And if you're falling uh, thirty thousand feet in two seconds, that would be about ten thousand miles per hour, or maybe sixteen thousand kilometers per hour, if it's two seconds for thirty thousand feet. So that would be pretty darn fast. Is this, no. um, I, I wrote this down, is this 2009 when this happened? Um, yeah, it could be. I don't have the notes here with me now because I have a, a whole list with all kind of dates, so I'm not 100% <laughs> sure. But I, I, I believe this was 2009, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Uh, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. And I think it's, um, uh, well, I don't know what else to say about it, but the, the fact that it's on a national border and, you know, one of the things that uh, I like to always find out is like, what what's the international political situation going on at this particular time? So if this was early 2009, uh, what was happening in Albania, there was, there's always US uh, shenanigans happening in some of these places. You have, do have to wonder, but even so a rapidly falling object of that kind of a speed, I, I, I don't have any clue as to what this could have been in terms of conventional technology. I guess you can't either. No, no. And, and the funny thing is that it was falling vertically down, so it was not slanted. Some people say it was probably a meteor, but I, I don't, I've don't. i never seen a meteor falling vertically down, especially not at that speed. And, and you said it was kind of maneuvering? Is that, did I hear no, that right? Just, just straight, straight okay. down. Great, straight down. Yeah. yeah. I have another one here. I don't know if I've got these in the right order. This is Greece. So this is a little earlier, I, I think, if I'm... Yeah, this was, um, I, I, I should have taken the notes here. Uh, this was, um, I think, in 2005. Uh, I, can, I can look it up in a second. But this was when I was flying the uh, the F-50 turboprop. Uh, we were mm -hmm. flying under contract for Olympic Airways or Olympic Airlines out of Athens. And we flew to all these little islands everywhere, which was really cool flying. Um, and at one point, I, I think we landed in a small airport called uh, Mykonos, one of those small islands that have just a single runway and we landed and after landing we had to make a 180 turn on the runway and the moment the airplane nose was facing north both my colleague and i we saw this light really bright light um, appearing in the night sky it was cloudless so you could see all the stars mm -hmm. and it was appearing it was moving a little bit towards the east it disappeared reappeared again moved a bit to the east disappeared this happened about four times then it disappeared again and showed up just a little bit further in the night sky and it shot off at incredible speed it was not even acceleration it was instant speed and it was along the same trajectory as the stuttering movement it made before and it was just incredible. I, I know that my colleague uh, was also pretty stunned. We said, "Wow, that's that's really something." Yeah. Now, this is an this is an artist recreation. I just want people to, I want to emphasize that this is not an actual photograph, but this is your recreation of that event. But uh, again, I mean, there. Are, I know you have said that you believe. Uh, I think you've said up to ninety nine percent of sightings are that you've experienced are explainable. But I, I gather that you're not so convinced in, in this case that you think this might not be easily explainable. Am I right in thinking that? Yes, correct. That's also why I yeah. list it as a, as a potential UAP. Yeah, exactly. And I only have a couple more of these artist recreations, but I'm just, oh, this is the same one, I believe. So yeah. do we need to, let me move on to one other. This is... If, if you don't mind, uh, with the previous one, what yes. made it so interesting here is uh, it happened during night and mm -hmm. during the flight preparation, uh, we knew that a large 
portion of the airspace south of uh, Greece was yes. closed down. It was because of the U.S. carrier group with the USS Theodore Roosevelt, the nuclear uh, nuclear powered aircraft carrier was passing by. Of course, we we don't know the exact location. They keep it secret, but at least we know that for a large part of the night, a huge part of the airspace was closed. So uh, the moment this light appeared and it it shot off at incredible speeds. Uh, the first answer we we basically had for ourselves was like, "Wow, this must be connected. This must be related to the uh, to the carrier group uh, passing by. Uh, it must be maybe some high tech military stuff." And it's only later that I that I heard exactly um, similar stories like this, with a with a light appearing high up in the night sky, stuttering movement of four times appearing and reappearing, and instant speed shooting off. I think even in the book uh, UFOs and Nukes by Robert Hastings, it's mentioned exactly the same uh behavior of, of a light in the sky as well and uh to finish it off just ju just because i guess some people might have a question about it i have no clue how high it was we we can judge distances a little bit from uh, as a as a pilot um uh, for objects that are uh let's say in the sky we always try to measure the distance to other airplanes if it's going to be a, mm -hmm. a factor for the uh, for a flight path in this case i can only say it was it was very high if it was maybe 20,000 feet or 30,000 feet or maybe even low Earth orbit, I, I have no clue of, uh, of telling. But let's say uh, if, if it was th flying at 30,000 feet, which is a big if, but let's say if it was flying at a normal air, airliner altitude, yeah. uh, the instant speed at which it shot off must have been at least Mach 30 or, or even higher. It was just oh God. incredible. But but then again, um, I don't know how high it was flying. You know, if if it was yeah. significantly lower, uh, it would have have it. You know, actually, the speed would have been lower as well. But it looks like it was a star, and it must have be must have been very very high. Well, you know, you mentioned the USS Roosevelt. I think a lot of people, when they heard that, immediately thought, "Oh yeah, this is only ten years before the Roosevelt had its own much now very famous encounters with UAP." quite regularly. The Roosevelt was off the uh, eastern Atlantic seaboard from the United States in 2014 and 2015. This is Ryan Graves. This is where he comes in, where they were encountering UA UAP, UFOs, almost daily, according to the New York Times article uh, about that for quite a long while. So I guess what I'm saying is the Roosevelt has a long history, I suppose, of uh, dealing with UFOs or UAP, because here they are again in the immediate vicinity of, of yeah, this, whatever and, and this is. Yeah, exactly, and 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 may, maybe this is connected to the USS uh, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, or maybe this is this stuff is happening with all the all the aircraft carriers. I have no clue. It's the only time I've seen it, and it's the only time that I knew that an aircraft carrier was close by. So, yeah, I think this is actually very very common, uh, not not just unique to the Roosevelt. So, can I can we talk about this uh, light over Germany? This might have, was this your first UAP sighting from the air? Am I right in thinking this? Yeah, that's correct. It's also okay. an artist impression because it just yes. happened so fast. Yes. Uh, this was, uh, I think I was even in training for the uh, for the F-50 turboprop. It's my first job as a, as a commercial pilot. So when, everything when was, was new. Uh, I'm sorry? When, I'm sorry, when was this? Uh, this was July 2005. Okay. Okay. And we were flying over Germany. I, I'm not sure exactly where, and I didn't know where, but it must have been around the city of Nuremberg, probably mm -hmm. in the south, the southwestern part. Uh, and as I said, you know, I, I, I think I was even still in training on the airplane, so everything was new. I was, I was new to uh, to weather phenomena, etc. I just building my uh, my flying hours and experience. And we were flying at night, even though the artist impression shows a daylight picture, but we were flying at night between two layers of clouds. It's difficult to say how high the layers were. Uh, let's say we were flying at 20,000 feet and the layers were maybe at uh, 25,000 and 10,000 feet. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, I'm looking from my perspective from the co-pilot seat towards the captain's window, like you see in the picture here, and I see this really bright light falling vertically down again uh, between the two cloud layers, and it's illuminating the lower cloud layer before it's passing through, and it disappeared. And it it just happened in an instant. So it was one one single dot of light moving extremely fast. And in retrospect, it looked exactly like the lights we just discussed that I saw over Greece a couple of years later. It was the same speed. It was incredible speed going down, and almost almost the same brightness, I would say. But it's difficult to say because I guess things at night they look um, slightly different uh, because the, the, your eyes are adjusted to to the lack of light. But it was moving vertically down, not not flashing, not pulsating, nothing, vertically down into the clouds, and it was gone. Would you, so, that's an incredible image here. So are, I guess the uh, 
the laser thin construction of that light, would you say that's accurate? Is that how you saw it? Because that's incredibly narrow. Well, I, I painted it in Photoshop like a laser, but it was just one, one single dot of light. So it was like a really bright star uh, or, or maybe even a bright planet, planet mm -hmm. Venus or Mars, as we see it sometimes in the sky. And it was just moving, single dot of light, moving, moving down. So it didn't have the laser-like appearance oh, like this. Good. Okay. I just yeah. want to make sure. But it was descending. Exactly. Uh, very much as you uh, described in the um, the case with in Greece. Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. What are these things? I just have to wonder what these things are. And I wonder if that would have been visible from somebody on the ground through the cloud layer. That would have been an interesting, interesting yeah. one. Uh, my my, my, my go-to answer back in the days, uh, especially since I wasn't that experienced, was uh, trying to explain it as a ball lightning maybe, or maybe a strange uh, lightning phenomena. Um, because I, I know that sometimes uh, pilots, they witness some really strange weather phenomena when they're flying inside a thunderstorm or around a thunderstorm. This could be because of the, the static discharge on the on the airplane or yeah. some, some, some strange weather phenomena. Um, I, I'm, I'm not saying it's a UAP. It could be a ball lightning of some sorts. But in both cases where I saw these vertically moving lights, there was no thunderstorm around. There was no weather. There was just absolutely nothing. So for me, it doesn't make sense if it's if it's a highly uh, uh, charged ball lightning or anything like that. Can I ask you, um, I mean, I'm not really much with meteorology. It's not my thing. But do, do meteors ever fall straight down is this is this something that they do i mean my understanding is that they'll usually come down at, at some kind of angle any kind of re-end and anything that's entering earth's atmosphere i don't i would think is unlikely to come down at a straight straight down am i well, wrong here or what do you think well um, I've seen I've seen thousands and thousands thousands of meteors. Uh, all of the meteors are basically uh, angled angled down, and they burn up in the atmosphere. But I guess hypothetically, it's possible that something could fall vertically down. Um, but it I I think it would look very very different. It could maybe explain the speed. But mm -hmm. normally, when something is burning up in the in the atmosphere, like like meteors or even really big ones that that, that hit the Earth, I've only seen them as as orange or yellow um balls of fire and i've never seen it like a completely white a pure white white dot of light ah oh, that's a good point as well yeah so there's some unique qualities about some of these vertically descending objects and by the way um that goes back through a fair amount of the ufo history which well we'll skip that for this but there is a, a fairly well documented series of of um events in which objects have been seen coming straight down or it seems to me, as far as the eyewitness is concerned, virtually straight down. So now we have, uh, I've got a few photographs that that are taken by you. And I'm wondering if maybe the one we can start with is the fascinating, the uh, lights in the Pacific, which if I'm not mistaken, this is what actually got you known among, for your photography first. Is that right? Yeah, that's correct. So yeah. you're flying, can you, so we've got a few of these images here. They are very interesting looking. What's this all about? Can you set the scene here for uh, viewers? This was uh, during a flight from Hong Kong to Anchorage on the 747 across the mm -hmm. Pacific. Uh, we were just with two pilots. Normally, we were three or four, but in this case, we were just with the two of us. And I was uh, using my camera to document the night sky. I was just taking pictures of uh, hopefully shooting stars or the Milky Way or anything that my camera uh, catches. And all of a sudden, um, on the on the edge of the horizon ahead of us, we see this really strange glow, orange reddish glow approaching yeah. the. I'm uh, going to show you. I think this. It's just yeah. barely right there, but as you approach, kind of like that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it was exactly on our on our uh, on our routing, and the first. Thing that that came to mind to us well, whoa there must be a volcano erupting below us because that night uh, there was a lot of activity in the ring of fire it was a lot of uh, volcanic activity in indonesia uh japan kamchatka alaska even down all the way to uh, to chile so before the flight we were aware of ash clouds and 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 all sorts of volcanic activity but this was a region where nothing was was predicted so when we saw this our uh, the major concern was uh, potentially flying into an ash cloud. So we were actually very, very uh, scared because we were in the middle of nowhere and all of a sudden we see this huge 
yeah, what is it? A uh, uh, patch of, of, of glowing orange and red below us. Uh, of course, I was taking pictures all the time. I just clicked away and I, uh, yeah, that's that zoomed in. Yeah. And uh, I was I was really documenting with whatever I was uh, I was seeing. Fortunately, we managed to stay clear of clouds, so that was actually our major concern. The moment you fly into a cloud, it could be a normal cloud, but if it's an ash cloud, the airplane is basically doomed. I mean, it's especially so far away from landfall, it's it's over. So our major concern was flying in clear skies and making sure that we uh, that we'll stay safe. And to give you an impression, these lights, um, the total size of this group of lights it was about the same size as to a city of winnipeg which i saw later was around i think 20 miles wide or 20 uh, miles got that here oh, yeah. we have a, a comparison this is winnipeg on the bottom yeah exactly and yeah. we were flying exactly at the same altitude and it was also at night and used the same settings with the camera the same lens mm -hmm. and later using google maps i could basically measure how big the, the the individual lights were in this case the total size of the of the of the group of lights was about 20 miles and each individual light was roughly the size of a football stadium and uh, that gave me kind of an impression of of, of the size and the, and the and the relative dimensions yeah that's amazing that they, the lights could be this large, uh, particularly when you describe how this was solved. And this is back <laughs> in, this was 2014, I believe, correct? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and so so what what did you determine is the solution to this bizarre mystery? It took me a couple of years uh, and a lot of uh, research, but basically I found out that this is um, uh, probably one of the first times that the Chinese use red lights on a sorry or a mackerel uh, fishing fleet. And normally red lights, they don't penetrate seawater because of the wavelength. That's also why underwater everything looks kind of blue. Mm -hmm. So uh, the eyes of fish are not even used to uh, to, to, to seeing red light or uh, light with, with, with wavelengths that, uh, that, that look red. So long story short, red was never used to, to, for fishing fleets. So for me, it was a big question what, what was going on there. It was only later that I realized that apparently the Chinese are nowadays using these red lights um, because the fish are unaware of the lights and they can easily fish them out of the, uh, the, the top layer of the ocean. And it, I think it was two or three years ago, there were images leaked out or, or distributed from uh, Shanghai and the whole city was, maybe was it Shanghai? I, I, I guess it was one of these big cities, and the whole sky was was turning orange. And it happened to be that they were testing these red lights on their huge fishing vessels, and it was it was it was extremely bright. Another thing I found out as well is that that very night there was a lot of sea mist on the uh, on the Pacific Ocean in that region. So probably these lights they illuminated the mist around it, so the the, the lights look much bigger than they actually were. So uh, it's a long it's a long story. It's kind of boring, but it's just a, a group of fishing fleets in the in the Pacific. That's incredible. Like, who would have known? Well, other than pilots like yourself who see this, but that a fishing fleet could be so expansive so large and the lights themselves so so intensely large as well i i can honestly say i would not have expected that there would be a fishing operation out there the size of a of a significant city yeah, well, I, I must say I'm, I'm I'm kind of used to seeing um, a squid fishing vessels, and especially around the continental plates uh, in Asia, but I think also South America, there are, there are huge numbers of uh, of white lights, sometimes green lights, that are used for fishing for squid and some other typical. Uh, um, um, fish that are, that are living in the ocean uh, but the red lights were never used so that's why i was kind of uh, dismissive of the uh, the fishing fleet theory in the beginning it was also yeah, yeah. also maybe interesting to uh, to note that um um my, my first answer was, well, this is probably like a volcanic eruption uh, happening right now. So that might mean that there's an island being born there. And after I finally arrived in Anchorage, I posted these pictures online. I think it was on Facebook and with a short story, just asking people, well, can you help me identify what it was? And as a kind of a joke, I was writing there, well, you know, if it's going to be a new island, at least I hope one of them will be named after me. But it, it, was, it was just a, a stupid joke. But interestingly enough, it was picked up by a lot of media, first in, in Europe and later on also in, uh, in the rest of the world. And a lot of media channels, mainstream media channels, etc., they were immediately um, saying that a Dutch pilot has saw a UFO base underwater. And it was immediately um, not really ridiculized, but it was it was 
constantly being connected with UFOs and aliens. And honestly, it didn't even even come to mind when I saw this stuff that it could be anything exotic or or extraterrestrial. So my my first reaction when I saw this because once the media get a hold of such a story, there's no way of 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 of, of guiding the media or, or or saying saying what I was thinking. So I was really afraid that I would going to be the uh, the laughing stock of the company, you know, that a lot of colleagues would, would make fun of me, and and it was it was really uh, something that that that's, uh, that that really worried me. But interestingly enough, none of my colleagues, really, absolutely none of my colleagues back then, uh, made fun of me. And actually, a lot of colleagues they start to um, uh, try to find reasons what we were seeing, and. I must also say that uh, in the months after, a lot of my colleagues, especially in the private setting when we were having dinner or maybe even during flight, uh, they told me some of their own experiences about, let's say, UFOs or une unexplained uh, phenomena that they've witnessed. So first of all, fortunately, we found out it was nothing dangerous to the airplane. But second of all, it really showed me that a lot of pilots are um, kind of open to... to um, acknowledging that, that, that there are sometimes things we see that we cannot immediately identify. I definitely want to return to that uh, before we are done here. It's interesting when you discuss the media and when it comes to UFOs, I have to say, I think the media has the emotional maturity of a teenager with a bad attitude. I think that's, <laughs> that's a big part of the media when it comes to the subject. In other words, they can't be trusted. There's not any kind of uh, genuine seriousness that's usually taken to the subject and there's there's a lot of still to this day kind of a knee jerk reaction. I have um, some other images of I think this is a, a satellite re-entry, and I wonder if I can ask you to discuss this here. Um, this this is is this another this is another photograph you've taken, and can you discuss what this is? Yeah, yeah, this is an, an actual uh, photo of the stuff that we saw. We were flying uh, 747 to, uh, I think it was the southern part of uh, Brazil. We were flying in the middle of the ocean. This was pretty much over the uh, the equator. And I fixed my camera on the glare shield basically to capture the Milky Way again and shooting stars. And I was just clicking away a lot of pictures. And especially in, during those kind of nights where there's no moon and you see all the stars, um, we, we kind of talk about let's say uh, the universe and life etc and we were completely alone up there there was no other traffic and we were just uh, chatting along and all of a sudden i see something out of the corner of my eye i was mm -hmm. co-pilot i was sitting on the right hand side a seat with a huge window here and I, I, I'm looking outside and I think, wait, we're being overtaken by another airplane. That's strange because, first of all, uh, the 747 is, 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 is really fast, so it doesn't happen often that we're being overtaken. And it was much higher. And then I, I actually stared at it uh, a bit better and I saw that it was like the, the big fireball with all kinds of small fireballs falling off that was, that was very high and just flying basically parallel to our uh, to our flight and it was uh, it was pretty clear it was pretty obvious that something was burning up in the uh, in the atmosphere above us so <laughs> fortunately i had my camera already there and i just kept clicking and clicking and uh, these exposures are each i think 20 or 30 seconds long um so within let's say within 2 minutes you could actually see that the that the object was passing from parallel to us uh, across the horizon fascinating yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, what what was this all about here? Why did you take this picture? Um, every time I see something uh, interesting or uh, that I cannot explain, I try to take a picture of the the flight instruments nowadays. So this is the instrument panel as you uh, as, as as I would mm -hmm. see it as a pilot. Yeah. It shows the speed. It shows the uh, the heading, the track. Yeah. It shows the altitude we're flying, the position, and on that little display on the lower left, you can easy, uh, even see the GPS coordinates where we're flying at that moment. Oh, okay. So by taking this picture, I basically uh, documented all the all the necessary data for uh, analyzing the event afterwards. You've got your metadata. Excellent. I can't zoom in on that. I wish I could, but people can do a freeze frame and maybe they can zoom in if they wish. But uh, yeah, fascinating. So that's just a, that's a satellite reentry. Did you say? Um, that this was like believed to be a Russian satellite, or did you have a solution to this? No, someone uh, actually the same story. I posted it on Facebook, and there was one gentleman. I forgot his name, but he's an uh, I think he was an amateur uh, astronomer, and yes. he's keeping yeah he's keeping track of a lot of uh, rocket debris. Uh, this in this case it was a Chinese rocket booster. I think Chinese. it was launched. 
yeah, it was launched uh, four or five years before, and they basically uh, let it drift in the uh, in low Earth orbit until it's it's slowly uh, reaching the point that it burns up. It's almost impossible to to predict the point that it's uh, it's it's getting so much resistance that it's actually going to burn up. But in this case, he looked at the trajectory we were flying, and he he basically overlaid it with his with his data from this uh, from this uh, uh, rocket booster, and he said, well, it was predicted that this thing would burn up in the next 24 hours somewhere uh, and it coincided exactly with the with, with the flight path and the pictures I took so uh, yeah basically within a couple of days it was identified uh, which which kind of rocket booster it was it, it was okay. yeah now there's one more uh, series of photographs that will show that are clearly identified by uh, yourself and by others and we could spend a few minutes here they're quite interesting this we have a series of these photographs. I'm not going to say anything. I'll just let you describe what we have going on here. Yeah, this was a flight. We were flying um, somewhere over the Himalaya, over uh, Inner Mongolia. And we were already aware that uh, there was a large part of airspace closed uh, just north of our route and south of our route. And this is an area where a lot of um, uh, 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 rockets and missiles are tested. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we saw this this little plume uh, growing on the horizon, and I immediately identified it as the uh, the rocket test that was uh, being done. And it's it's pretty cool that you can see. And nowadays, you see it more often with SpaceX uh, giving off these huge plumes in the upper atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was clearly a two stage uh, ICBM, I think, or rocket. Right. Here's and the second stage coming right here, isn't it? Yeah. So this is just to show people that uh, I'm not making things up. I'm not misidentifying things. But in this case, we immediately knew what it was, and we were just enjoying the view. And of course, I was able to take a few pictures. And for someone completely unaware, this might look um, maybe uh, very exotic, but it's something pretty mundane. Uh, but it's it's still pretty cool to look at. Oh, most definitely. Uh, I think it's awesome. And uh, what what? How did this happen then? What's this image? That's, uh, um, I took that one or two minutes later, that's uh, part of the exhaust uh, plumes in the upper atmosphere that are being illuminated by the sun that's I, already uh, behind the horizon. I suppose it's just a, a fact of the wind blowing the uh, the illuminated plume in different directions, is that what this effect so. here is? Yeah. yeah, I think so, I think so. And there's also some instability in the exhaust gases themselves as well, I guess. It's, it's pretty complicated what's happening up there, I think. And, uh, oh, here's your... Uh, your metadata, taking a, a shot of it, you've got your instruments, but there's the the object in the background there, or the yeah. effect in the background. Uh, very interesting. Now, you, what do I have here? I'm trying to think. Is this? Oh, I, that's the cause that we already looked at that one. I'm I'm skipping ahead here. Can I ask you about your last sighting that you believe is still unexplained? And this took place over Spain. Can we discuss this? And the photograph you have here that we're about to show is, it's not as dramatic as some of the others, but it's, when you really look at it, it's quite interesting, very interesting. <laughs> Yeah, and I'm I'm uh, I'm the first to admit that the picture I took of this thing was is really underwhelming. Yeah. But if we take into account the context and um, yes. the fact that we saw it over an hour, it makes it kind of a compelling case. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were flying a seven three seven Boeing seven three seven from Amsterdam in the Netherlands to Malaga, which is located on the southern part of, of Spain. And um, it was just after sunset, and we just crossed the Pyrenees, which are the mountains mm -hmm. between France and, and, and Spain. And all of a sudden, my captain, a very senior, experienced guy, he, he's asking me, can you look outside? Do you see that as well? And I was just looking outside, and all of a sudden, I saw this really, really small speck or, or, or uh, object, whatever it was, on, uh, hovering pretty high above the horizon and pretty mm -hmm. far away. And I was looking at it, and I was really wondering what it was because I've, it, it, it didn't show uh, any any features that you would see from a contrail of another airplane or or even another airplane or a cloud. And we were looking at it for about five minutes, and we were really wondering what kind of a strange airplane or balloon would that be because it has a it had a really strange shape. Um, so I decided after ten minutes, since it was still there. I was I, I just wanted to know what it was, so I called the air traffic controller, Madrid air traffic control, and I asked him, well, what kind of airplane is flying ahead of us? Because we're really wondering what it is. Um, by the way, this is the image, the original image that came from the camera. It in real life. 
because the camera was kind of shitty back then, uh, the, the eyes could actually distinguish a, a more elongated uh, shape. Uh -huh. but, then, but anyway, the, the air traffic controller in Madrid, uh, he was really surprised. He said, well, no, you guys are, are, first of all, we're on a direct route to Malaga, so we didn't have to follow any airways. And they only give those kind of direct routings when the airplane when the airspace is pretty much empty. So we were on the direct routing, and he said, "No, there's no 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 traffic ahead of you. What do you see?" So I explained to him, "Say, well, there is a there is an object, or at least there's something flying ahead of us. Uh, it's difficult to say how far it is, but we were really wondering what it is. Mm -hmm. And instead of dismissing it, which often happens by by air traffic control, um, he says, "Well, I want you guys to contact the military air traffic controller because he wants to know everything about your." your uh, your sighting so i dial in the other frequency and uh, i'm calling this uh, spanish military air traffic controller which was kind of interesting and he was very interested in our in our sighting and he wanted to know everything that we saw the distance relative uh, bearing uh, the uh, the size of the object and he confirmed as well that there was no absolutely no known traffic ahead of us over Spain. Uh, he said there's no weather balloons. Apparently they're tracking that. I didn't even know it. He says there's 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 no weather balloons. There's no traffic, absolutely nothing. Um, so that was really interesting. And uh, well, after that, nothing really happened. The object for over an hour, because we were flying all the way to, to Malaga, which was over an hour flight uh, during the sighting, the object never really changed position. It never changed shape. It didn't grow uh, smaller or larger. And it was just there. And it was really strange. Also interesting to note is that we were flying at 41,000 feet, which is not exceptionally high, but it doesn't doesn't happen often that uh, commercial airliners are flying at 41,000 feet. Yeah. In this case, the object that we saw, it was significantly higher. It was uh, placed well above the horizon. And there's simply not too much uh, commercial traffic that can even reach those kind of altitudes, let alone cruise there for, for a long, long period of time. So uh, after one hour, pretty much one hour, we are descending into the clouds uh, for our approach into Malaga. And uh, we were basically turning slowly towards the east. And the moment we were, we were descending into the clouds, mm -hmm. I could still see the object from my, from my right-hand window. And it was just still there. It was a solid object. So in, in the beginning, we saw the object just straight ahead. But the moment we turned, the object was just still there, just on the same position. And it must have been flying or hovering uh, somewhere over Africa. And I have no clue how how large it it, it would have been. It depends on the um, on the distance, which is impossible to guess it as well. But let's say if 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 it was stationary, and since it didn't change shape, size, or 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 altitude from us, um, if it was stationary, it must have been extremely far away and extremely big because it must have been really high up in the atmosphere. Um, if it was another airplane that we were seeing, maybe looking into the back of its contrail. It's it's really strange because I don't know what kind of airplane would leave such a, such a square contrail and would fly so high. And on top of that, it was um, it was flying exactly ahead of us for over an hour, which is really strange. On top of that, uh, every commercial airplane has this TCAS system on board. That means every commercial airplane has a transponder, and these transponders they're communicating with each other to prevent um, uh, near misses or even accidents. And on the navigation display, we can always see all the traffic around us uh, within a, an 80 mile radius. And you can sometimes filter it out uh, uh, if you want to see high traffic, low traffic, or the same altitude. And I was playing with the TCAS system just to see if there was any traffic ahead of us or even uh, even above us. Absolutely nothing. There was no you traffic. Nothing. You did not pick up a thing? Nothing. Nothing. There was no no commercial traffic ahead of us. Yeah. When uh, Well, so first of all, uh, you're facing... And that was Morocco uh, over facing that part of Spain, isn't it? That's Morocco. Yeah, yeah. correct. So um, that's where you think it probably was. It was probably hovering over that portion. So on the other side of the Mediterranean, which there is not very wide, you know, when you get to that part of Spain. So um, that's really interesting. I want to ask you uh, about the radar components of uh, commercial aviation compared with military. They can't be the same, right? So, are there um, were there are there significant filters on your commercial airliner um, aircraft, as well as with a commercial air traffic control? Are are there uh, objects that are filtered out that maybe the military does not filter out? You, you understand what I'm asking? 
Yeah, am, am yeah. I putting that right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's a very, very good question. Um, well, also let me state that uh, we, every airplane is equipped with a weather radar as well. So our airplane uh, was was constantly scanning for weather, and this is a, a Doppler kind of system. Um, some people ask me, could you see it on 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 our own radar? And I have to say no, because our our weather radar is really specialized into in in predicting, uh, or let's say. Um, detecting a weather phenomena but sometimes uh, it's picking up on other airplanes uh, that are flying let's say within 10 or 20 miles of us in this case it's maybe a fun fact to know that our own weather radar didn't give any reflections didn't see anything it's it doesn't mean anything but at least uh, this is a question i get asked very often uh, and yes there is a, a big difference between um, the radar being used by the civil air, air traffic controllers mm -hmm. and military uh, uh, just the military in general but also military air traffic control um I don't know all the details about it, but at least for as far as I know, um, civil radar is using, um, it, uh, there's a name for it. It's like, a, I think they call it secondary radar, which means it's only showing objects that are um, uh, transmitting a signal back to the radar. So it's like an interrogation process. Like so from the, a transponder. Exactly, exactly. So it's okay. only the traffic being shown um, that has a transponder in it, because otherwise the, the 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 displays of air traffic controllers get really cluttered. It also depends a bit on the on the country. Uh, I think, for example, in the Netherlands and also in the United States, um, the air traffic controller can also see the weather uh, displayed and as an overlay on his uh, uh, on his display. I don't know if it's coming from the same uh, radar or if it's coming from a different source, but it's really optimized optimized for um, uh, yeah managing commercial traffic. Military radar, um, it's, a lot of specs are, are not public, so I, I, I don't know too much about it. But I do know it's, uh, they're using primary radar, which means that there is a possibility to see all the reflections coming back from, from, a, from a radar signal. Uh, nowadays, especially since everything is digital, or at least I guess it's 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 digitalized. Uh, they can filter certain objects. So um, certain objects that could represent birds are filtered out because otherwise the whole display is completely cluttered. Uh, I guess they can filter out uh, filter out really low traffic or uh, general aviation traffic. And I think this is also playing a major role. What we've seen now with the, with the balloons being shut down over yes. the over the states, because I think. Um, there was just a, a blind gap in, in, in radar data being being uh, seen and transmitted. So, um, but then again, I'm no specialist in radar, so I just know my own perspective from a pilot's uh, point of view. Well, I, I asked this question, and thank you for that. That was uh, very illuminating. But I asked because I'm thinking you're looking at this uh, incredible object. I'll zoom in on it again here. That you're not picking up on your. Uh, your instrumentation, which in theory, one would think you would have, but you didn't. And your civilian um, air traffic controller was also not picking up anything. And in theory, one would have thought it should have been able to, but I think you explained it very well. It, it's like there's, there's a filter system in place. This is 2010 when this was, uh, when this took place, but it, it seems as though unknown traffic or un- scheduled traffic and things like this are just typically not going to be picked up on the civilian system unless well, i'm missing something here well you know i uh, in my in the last 20 years of flying i did some military contract work as well and i've done i've done some uh, uh, flying business in the, the unglamorous side of aviation and sometimes this included some uh, uh, military charter flights or even um mm. Uh, gray flights, let's say, um, but also these kind of flights, these charter flights and the flights that are not, not let's say, visible on Flight Radar 24, uh, they are still known to regular air traffic control because we're just we're still taking part of, of normal uh, normal routes and, and air traffic. So um, even if it was like an unscheduled flight or um, a clandestine flight, it, it, air traffic control would have known about it and especially military air traffic control. Yeah, okay. They would, they're right. I mean, for your own safety, you need to know these things. Uh, by the way, you did it. Uh, there's an uh, an AI enhancement of this image. May I show this here? Sure. So this is uh, the non zoomed in version, and I guess I'll just uh, I'll just zoom in. So that's this is an AI enhancement. Yeah, and this this is pretty uh, close to what it looked like to the naked eye. So this is also what triggered our uh, um, our curiosity because it's not shaped like any any airplane that we. Uh, 
that we've ever yeah. seen. It's not shaped like a, like a contrail. It's sometimes you're looking into the back of a contrail, but yeah. uh, well, first of all, it, it doesn't even look like this. And and second of all, uh, these contrails are inherently unstable. So after one minute or even less, you see them changing or even disappearing. So. Yeah. We saw it for over an hour, and as I said, you know, it was cigar shaped, and it, it this, this is pretty much how we saw it with the naked wow. eye. Yeah, that's that's quite remarkable. Uh, it's also quite amazing what AI enhancements are able to do with photographs, and one sometimes wonders are they are they uh, distorting the image? But in your opinion, this actually did genuinely enhance it. Uh, Definitely. Again. But maybe maybe with the exception of the, the, the upper left corner, because it shows like it's a little bit uh, uh, facing upwards. upwards. Yeah, yeah um, it does look like that. Yeah, it, I must say, um, I don't know, this could be an artifact from the AI software as well, but it looked right. like cigar shaped, just flat and and uh, right. uh, basically like a yeah, cigar shaped. Well, I, I think it's, it's quite remarkable. So... Um, I would like to ask you, I mean, there, you have a few other images, but they're, uh, I don't know if we really need to show, they're, they're just kind of cool images. I'll, I'll just show one or two here that are just kind of awesome. Uh, this is the Canadian Northern Lights. You took this image. That's pretty neat. And this one, what the, this is St. Elmo's Fire and we just well, flying. <laughs> what, what happened here? Well, honestly, I must uh, say this is one of the the urban legends. This is actually not Saint Elmo's fire. I think ah. I think uh, the the foul had the, the wrong name. Um, oh, but this is, <laughs> this is typical for um, for airliners flying into uh, an area with a, with a lot of um, um, electromagnetic discharge, or let's yeah, say even okay. inside a, a thunderstorm. So what you sometimes see, and this this is kind of a nice example. You see my colleague laughing as well there. Yeah. Um, the whole airplane sometimes starts to glow purple and and uh, and uh, pink. In this case, you can actually see the air around the airplane also starting to glow. And all of a sudden, you have all these little sparks, all these little um, lightning flashes or sparks just shooting all over the windows. It's it's harmless. It's wow. completely harmless. But it's it's really cool to see. I guess, I guess if it's the first time, you might be a little more nervous than subsequently. But it's rather impressive. Feels like you're on a, another planet here, just flying through <laughs> their crazy yeah. atmosphere. But it's, it's Earth. And uh, shooting stars. Yeah, this is just an example of um, well, this is taken with the fisheye lens, yeah. just to have some fun. And I placed the, ca the camera on the glare shield, shooting up or looking up, and I left the, the lens open for about thirty seconds. And uh, you see a couple of uh, meteors falling. Some of some of them are really bright, some of them are really weak. And there's even a satellite moving in the lower right corner. You, they have these little curly strings sometimes because the camera movement or the airplane movement but um yeah this, this is the stuff that we sometimes see from the from the cockpit so a lot of people tell me ah you know you probably saw starlink or you saw a, a meteor and i'm showing this image saying you know i'm i'm not stupid i've, I've seen thousands of meteors I, I i know what it looks like yeah you guys see it all up there and then there's this uh rather interesting image halo yeah. moon contrail yeah, we were, we were basically flying behind another 747 over the Pacific. And sometimes oh. when the upper cloud layer, uh, let's say in the upper atmosphere, is, is very thin, it's just a lot of ice crystals, you see those beautiful uh, halos around the moon, and it's it's beautiful sometimes. That, that's uh, quite awesome. I just think it's it's um, very useful for, for people to realize when a commercial pilot sees something that really doesn't fit, uh, I think we can, I mean, especially if they're experienced like yourself, I think we can acknowledge you've seen it all or you've seen most of it. And so if there's something unusual, we need to pay attention. A lot of times I find UFO skeptics or debunkers will uh, often try to minimize uh, the observations of experienced commercial pilots. And I, I think that's generally unfair. Well, yeah, yeah. I, I, I completely agree. If, if, you, uh, if you don't mind, I would like to add that... Um, I think the reason why pilots, especially commercial pilots, military pilots, are should be taken uh, serious as um, uh, credible observers is because we're not looking for UFOs. We're not looking for something uh, extraordinary. We, we're only concerned with flight safety. I'm being paid to, to fly the airplane as safe as possible from A to B. And everything I see during the flight is, is seen um from the perspective of flight safety so if i see a flashing light somewhere i'm constantly trying to identify what it is if it's traffic if it's flying at the same altitude different altitude um is there maybe a thunderstorm uh, somewhere ahead that's, uh, that's making uh flashes i'm constantly 
trying to look at everything in the flight safety related aspect and the same with those red lights as i discussed before it didn't even come to mind that it could have been something uap related the only thing that we were worried about is an ash cloud and maybe even flying into 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 something weather related that we didn't know and the moment that pilots especially experienced pilots who've seen thunderstorms from the inside and outside and especially if 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 uh, experienced pilots but also i guess military personnel and radar operators from air traffic control when they say they are dealing with something that they don't understand or cannot identify i think we have to take it serious because our intention is not um to create drama it's not our intention to 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 look for ufos we're just trying to do our job and and uh guarantee the flight safety in this case of, of my airplane yes absolutely i very well said there are um a few instances in the history of commercial aviation where you get these very significant uh responses to sightings of ufos so there is one from the 1980s it's famous among researchers called jal 1628 from 1986 and uh, you have basically have a Japanese airline flying over Alaska with a lot of expensive French wine. And for about a half hour, he, the, uh, the captain and crew see an enormous, absolutely gargantuan uh, UFO that actually um, seemed to release a couple of smaller objects that were in, in front of their cockpit for some time, bathing them in green light. Uh, that, that's a whole story. We don't have to get into the details here. But that particular pirate uh, pilot, uh, Ken, Kenjiro Tarauchi, I believe, he was actually grounded from flying for over a year uh, because he reported this. He, he got a lot of bad blowback and uh, eventually was able to fly again. And then more recently, in 2006, of course, a uh, very famous Chicago O'Hare Airport sighting um, over the United Airlines um, area at Chicago, seen by pilots, seen by um, air uh, airport workers. I just wonder what, now in, in that case, in the O'Hare case, that's 2006, so you were flying, you were an active commercial pilot at this point. I would, I would like to know what you or what your colleagues in particular at that time in 06 and 07, how you guys responded to that. This had to be something that was a matter of discussion. And what's, what's the culture you were alluding to this before, but what's the culture of commercial pilots relating to UFOs back during the O'Hare incident and subsequently? Can you speak about that? Yeah, yeah, interesting. I must say uh, that this UAP topic is actually not even a topic among pilots. And I must honestly, honestly admit that I only heard about the incident at O'Hare uh, maybe, maybe two or three years later. And um, I'm... Well, first of all, I think it, uh, it's also important to note that uh, nobody really took it serious until these audio recordings uh, came out, where mul multiple people on the same frequency admitted to, to seeing that object. And I, I must really admit that when I heard the story, I, I just read a headline, my first uh, idea was, well, it's probably nothing, it's like a balloon. It's like it, it, the chances that something like that would be appearing in public and and even a metallic object if i if i understand it correctly mm. uh that's so far fetched it's it's still difficult for me to to accept it uh immediately it's only after i was uh, reading more about the details about that that event and how it basically shot up at one point at incredible speed and was leaving a hole in the clouds which means that it was either very hot or even even displacing air um, I realized there was more to it than just a balloon or something else. Um, but it's only because I, I stumbled upon the article somewhere on the internet. But it's it's not being discussed by pilots. It's not being discussed in, in aviation at all. And I think this is mainly because the, the whole topic still is... Um, uh, is, is, is really um, affected by the fringe factor around it. And that's really a shame. And... Um, yeah, I think I think that's that's uh, that's that, that's a major reason for a reason for this uh, topic not really being discussed. Openly. That's amazing. That's amazing to me because I remember when that story came out. Really, it broke in January of '07. Uh, the event happened in in no, on November six, uh, no, November excuse me, November seventh, uh, two thousand six, and it it came out just two months later. It didn't take that long before it really broke out and it became such a big story. I believe at the time it was the largest, uh, the, the most widely read article by the Chicago Tribune, maybe in its history. It was, it was huge, it was huge, it was worldwide. And still it was ignored apparently by 
your colleagues and your your community for all that time. I just find that fascinating because, you know, if, when you're in the UFO field, you might be thinking, what else do we need to do here to get <laughs> your attention? Wake up. I mean, yeah. if the O'Hare case did not get the attention of commercial pilots, I really have to wonder what would. Because yeah. that really was quite a remarkable event. Quite well, remarkable. De definitely, definitely. Um, and it was only after 2010 that I started to fly uh, to the States and also to O'Hare myself. So I, w I wasn't flying to to, to Chicago uh, the moment that happened. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I know from experience the airspace uh, above and around O'Hare is incredibly chaotic. I mean, chaotic in, in an organized way, but it's so busy. And when you're flying there, especially looking at your navigation display, you see traffic just all over the place. So I think for many pilots, uh, first of all, they're you know, if it doesn't affect their flight immediately, they're not really that interested. And second of all, um, I think it's really important to keep in mind that a lot of pilots, but maybe also military personnel and, and, and other credible observers, are simply not interested in it. And it could have different reasons. Maybe um, uh, some people, especially people who've never seen anything themselves, like I did, fortunately, with this falling lights, etc., um, they cannot take it serious. Even 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 not reading the articles, etc. So there's a, a certain percentage of pilots that are simply not not interested in it. Yeah. Um, there's also uh, a group of pilots who might be interested in it, but yeah, well they they don't read up on that on that stuff because they basically dismiss it beforehand. Uh, and I say I must say. I, the only reason I'm, I'm interested in this topic is because I've seen four things that I cannot identify. And especially being a captain now, I, I'm even more aware of the flight safety aspects and the responsibility that we carry as pilots. So for me, it took well, it took almost 10 years to realize that what I've seen was was abnormal. So for many pilots, um, it it's it's just not 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 interesting to them. Well, I, this leads, oh, I'm so sorry. I think I just interrupted you. <laughs> oh, no, no. Just, just on a finishing note, um, it was really interesting because after I came forward with my uh, uh, interview with, with Vinnie Adams on the disclosure team, a couple of my colleagues apparently uh, saw the interview as well. And it was really interesting. I had a, a long conversation with one of my co-pilots. And apparently at one point he said, I would be absolutely scared if I see something that I don't understand. So I don't even want to look out of the window or or I don't want to identify something that I cannot see. And he was not saying it to dismiss it, but he was very open about it because the implications um, of seeing something that you cannot identify in the air, um, they could range from maybe extraterrestrial or, or maybe even something unexplained. Mm -hmm. And for some people, this is a barrier to even think about it. And so I guess the barrier to identify it and to openly talk about it um, is huge for some people. This is a psychological issue that's uh, that's affecting a lot of people, I think, worldwide. Yeah, that's actually, you, you've kind of pre-answered a question that I had in my mind. Oh. And uh, But but let me just bring this to uh, really wrapping up what our conversation here. Uh, I'm interested in the, can, the current culture among your colleagues relating to this. And I think you started really to address that. Uh, but along that lines, I would also be interested to ask you, are there, I, I'm guessing what the answer here is, but I would like you to take, to address this. Are there any reporting procedures in place today among airlines to report such unusual traffic, or is this all de just dependent upon pilot initiative? And, and also, I would ask, if you report something, like what you did on Approach to Malaga in 2010, um, is it, are, do you ever expect to get an answer? <laughs> um, are, are there any, like, investigations that you are aware that ever go on uh, by any other bodies to, to determine what, what you may have seen and do they ever get back to you? Is, is there a system in place here? Or is this whole thing simply dependent upon the initiative of people like yourself? A very good question. And um, well, anything UAP related is is uh, there is no no system in place. I must say nowadays every airline, every big company, they have a, um, a safety management system in place, and uh, this works really well. Every time I see something that could pose a threat potentially to the operation, to the airplane, to the safety, or even if I see that some procedures are faulty, I can write a report and the, the, the uh, there will be an investigation and sometimes they change the procedures, sometimes they uh, they address a maintenance issue, you name it. It's, it's, it's a very, very um, foolproof system to, um, to, to increase the safety and safety awareness within every airline. 
The problem is if I see something that's not a direct threat to my flight, and if I if I write a report about it, they cannot do anything with it. It's like saying um, writing a report saying, "Well, I saw a, a meteor." Or the northern lights. I'm pretty sure, you know, if my, my chief pilot will say, "Well, I'm happy for you, but this is nothing, not, not, nothing we can do about it." Right, right. And that's the issue with many of the UAP sightings. At least, you know, my my four sightings, these these uh, moving lights and the, the solid objects, they never posed a threat to my airplane. So, the airline itself, they cannot really do anything with it. Right. Um, let's say if there was an, um, I, I fortunately I never experienced it myself, but uh, sometimes it happens that airplanes are getting too close to each other and it's considered a, a near miss or a potential safety hazard. Um, I guess there could be an official investigation and then air traffic control will be investigated as well, or at least they, they can do their um, uh, the sayings and probably the radar data will be analyzed. But this is only if there is a serious uh, safety uh, a bre breach of, of, of safety. In this case, with UAP, if there's no 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 apparent safety issue, uh, I don't know what kind of system could actually be used to investigate. Yeah. It kind of makes I'm, sense in a way. I mean, look, they're they're a for-profit commercial organization. It's even arguably just not their mandate, right? All they care yeah. about is, as you say, the safety. Uh, exactly. I'm just curious. I just you know, is there any kind of procedure in place? And and uh, it seems like they're isn't really unless it unless it affects safety exactly exactly and that's why i think it's so important to um for, for pilots first of all to realize uh that sometimes experienced colleagues are seeing something they cannot identify and i think we have to raise a level of awareness that that uap are are, are, are a serious thing i'm very happy that um, i got in touch with uh, enigma labs which is a, a company in the us starting up and uh, they are going to launch an app where um, let's say credible observers like uh, like me and other pilots um can um, enter all the data from a sighting they've seen and they want to basically build a database with sightings and objective uh, uh, data to um, yeah to to analyze it and I think this is the best way to go because uh, every pilot has, an, has, has, a, has a mobile phone or an, or an iPad if we see something and maybe if it's just once in 10 years but if a pilot is seeing something they cannot explain, just put it in the in the app and and let the uh, let the computer algorithm analyze it. And um, yeah, probably ninety nine percent of the times it's like Starlink or a pilot is is misidentifying something. But you have to have the data, uh, and you can only analyze something objectively with um, if you have enough data. So I think the best way to go if 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 more and more pilots, but also let's say military personnel, etc., um, they are aware of such an app. They are aware of of this system being being implemented to analyze uh, their sightings, and uh, slowly but surely we have to get rid of the stigma. And I think this is the only the only way to go. Is this uh, Enigma app? Is this actually currently available, or is this in development? Yeah, it's still in development. I, I think I think it's still it's already available, but it's still in a in, in a development phase. So uh, actually, oh. as we speak, there there will be a lot of uh, details coming out, and I'm going to be one of their um, uh, like a beta um, tester part. type of thing. Yeah, exactly. And I'm going to do a little bit of a, um, uh, a media presence as well to uh, to basically talk about this this app. Oh, but more more will follow soon. Yeah. How stand? How that's I think fascinating and uh, a cool idea and a and a useful idea. Definitely, um, definitely, yeah. Last question I want to ask you for this um, interview, Christian, which, by the way, I've just, it's been fabulous, and I'm very grateful. Thank you for this. How many um, of your colleagues would you say have seen something that they consider, let's say, difficult to explain or potentially unexplainable? Um, do, you have, do you have a sense of how widespread this is, or is this just maybe not difficult to know? very difficult to answer that because it depends also on the personalities you're flying with um i've uh, i've heard a couple of, of my colleagues talk about the things that they've seen and some of the sightings that 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 colleagues have seen are extremely compelling even even um uh, ridiculous uh, mm. and they have absolutely no clue what it was uh, to give you an example one of my colleagues he came forward with his own experience after he saw these red lights that i uh, uh, documented over the pacific mm -hmm. and uh, i think it was a month later and we talked about it and he said a couple of years before so it must have been in the 80s or 90s maybe he was flying with a 747 to uh, to south africa from europe and in the middle of the night and i think it must have been somewhere over central africa just just completely empty airspace 
and he was overtaken by a group of glowing lights. And a 747 is flying really fast, close. I mean, we're flying Mach 0.86, so that's, that's let's say, roughly 90% of the speed of sound. And he was overtaken by maybe 5, 15, I don't know, uh, glowing lights that were just completely unbothered by him. And they just shot off into the, into the uh, uh, distance parallel to his, uh, to his flying uh, track. 15, he said, well, never seen them? anything like it, no. And this is the stuff, and, and, and me, uh, uh, this guy, I think he was flying already for 20,000 hours. He said, well, this is the only time uh, he's seen something that he cannot explain. So this is at least one guy who was open to admit it and to talk about it and, and, to, and to basically give me the, uh, the statistical data of seeing once something that he cannot explain. Uh, some other colleagues, uh, they've, uh, they've come forward to me with, with their own sightings. Sometimes just a single strange moving light in the sky. Others have reported um, even metallic looking objects. But it's so difficult to say because I know as well that one of my colleagues, um, he he refuses to basically even think about the subject. And he says, oh, yeah, you probably saw a rocket launch. It's something military. So whatever it is, for those people, it's it's always um, uh, rationalized. So maybe these people have seen some really incredible things that they uh, rationalize it for whatever reason as something military or something yeah. like a rocket launch. Yeah. In general, if I have to put a number on it, I think... Um, roughly between 30 and 40 percent uh, of my colleagues have maybe seen something that they cannot identify. I'm not saying I'm, I'm not saying it's a UAP because maybe it's something mundane, but 30 to 40 percent of my colleagues have potentially seen something that they cannot explain. Uh, and my, I think my last question. I know I keep hassling you here, for asking more questions. But do you get the idea that most of those unexplained sightings? were reported or not reported to traffic controllers not, have, not reported definitely were not. not reported yeah maybe sometimes an inquiry uh if there's any military activity if there's any any other uh, traffic ahead but i noticed that most of the time uh, air traffic control is completely uh, uninterested in in such uh, uh questions so no it's it, it, it's uh, it's it's nearly always left um uh, unreported or undocumented i think it's great that you're uh, as public as you are about this subject. And you know what I, I like is that you're not, you're not like a, a proselytizer. You're not out to evangelize the world about UFOs or aliens or anything like that. That's not your thing. You're, I think, very rational. Uh, you take the time to study what you've actually seen and look for, uh, you know, naturalistic explanations at every opportunity. Uh, you you absolutely are not the kind of person to jump onto the most extreme solution to something that you've seen. And that's precisely what is uh, needed in the UFO field, of course, and that is exactly what you do. Uh, but also at the same time, I think it's commendable that you are uh, not afraid to go public with the things that you have seen and, and thereby encouraging other pilots such as yourself, uh, I would like to think, to come forward with what they have seen. And uh, to you know, you're you've become a leader in your in your field, uh, whether you intended to or not. I think I think that has happened, and I'm I'm very glad to be able to have this conversation with you, sir, because I think that this can lead to to more positive outcomes from other pilots, and I think I would like nothing more than to see that happen, um, because there there does seem to be this culture in place among uh, your colleagues to just not talk about it for a whole array of reasons. And I, I think it'll be good to see that change, hopefully. Definitely. And in that sense, it might sound strange, but uh, in the last couple of weeks when these balloons were being shot down or even mm -hmm. uh, seen over, over the US, I was so happy. And of course, I'm not happy that, that, that uh, apparently uh, uh, military action is needed. But for the first time, it was basically coming in the news that there is stuff out there even even hovering or flying at altitudes where normal airliners are flying, and it's being considered a, a threat for air safety. For the first time, I was thinking, yeah, you see, we're not crazy. When we're seeing something, uh, there might actually be a balloon. There might be some um, maybe military surveillance equipment, whatever it is. But now, apparently, in, in, in one and a half week time, three of those objects have been shut down. They're probably something pretty mundane and, and rather boring. Uh, but it was proof that pilots sometimes see some some stuff that was uh, laughed at until until three weeks ago, and now we have 
proof that there's stuff out there. So I think um, there is a growing feeling of awareness among among pilots that there is stuff out there, and um, yeah, it's 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 important to uh, to mention because especially with these balloons, who knows how many decades these kind of balloons have been flying there, and pilots are so afraid of reporting them because of, because of the stigma, and if it was taken serious more, uh, let's say earlier on, a lot of those balloons might actually have been identified already. So mm -hmm. I, think, I think we're living in interesting times and the stigma yeah. just has to, has to go. Well, yeah. And I think a lot of it comes down to the different filtering system that civilian aviation apparently uses as opposed to uh, what places like NORAD and the military sources are able to get. So there's a, that discrepancy as well. And I think that came up in the whole balloon uh, shenanigans as well. So um, yeah, very good point. Well, let's uh, let's wrap this up here. I've actually very much appreciated your time for this interview, and I will have links below for anyone who wants to follow your work. That includes uh, you have a a Twitter account, uh, I think fairly active there. You've got Instagram. Um, oh, do you want to talk a little bit about your book? Or uh, actually, it's gone through two editions. Do you care to discuss that before we? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, oh well. Thanks, uh, thanks for mentioning it. Uh, and especially active on Instagram, and that's my main uh, portal for my photography. It was actually interesting. Um, I was in in North Korea in 2014, I think, and I met a tour guide there, there, a British guy, and he was an aviation geek as well. We had a lot of time, a lot of fun, and I was discussing all my adventures in in, in Africa and Afghanistan and uh, all the all the all the the cowboy stories from from those days. And after I came home, he sent me an email. He said, "Wow, I'm I'm so impressed." with those stories and he, of course i was taking a lot of pictures as well he says um, um i'm a i'm an indie publisher for aviation books would you like to publish a book because it yeah i think there's a lot of material for it it would be kind of cool mm. so we came up with a plan of, of of making a coffee table book and he warned me he said well you know the aviation market is market is kind of uh, small but you know what if we print a thousand books maybe you can sell a hundred of them and then at least you have some of them as a gift for your family etc so i thought you know what i have nothing to lose let's let's just go for it and within one year, the the three print runs were completely sold out. It's um, it's a, it's a bestseller. It was unbelievable, and um, yeah, it, it, it was it was really cool. It won uh, quite some awards. It's it's a coffee table book with stories and and photos combined. And last year, uh, no, maybe even two years ago, uh, I became a captain, and to celebrate that, actually, we wanted to make a new. Uh, print run of the book but I decided you know what the book is already five years old now so let's make a captain's edition so it has 20 or 30 more pages uh, some updated stories and uh, I updated the story about the red lights as well because that's a whole chapter in the in the book and uh, yeah the captain's edition is now in store and it's still selling like like crazy so the book is now in its fifth print run and I know I don't know how many thousands are being sold still today it's incredible and actually the book was <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. And it was also a trigger for me back in 2015 um, to to take my own photography more serious and to basically level it up to a more professional level. And I'm really hoping to publish more books in the future because it's uh, I feel that this it, there is a huge market for it. So photography, I, I, I try to write a little bit as well, especially uh, the captions um, uh, underneath the pictures on social media. They they uh, they they attract a lot of attention, positive attention as well. And I, I'm really hoping to publish a book one day soon with let's say a combination of more text narratives that fit the pictures and uh, yeah let's let's let let's see what the future holds i have i have a link for this uh to your amazon uh below but what is the name of the book uh, cargo pilot good i, I want yeah. people to be able to check it out cool uh, very nice well christian uh, van heis thank you so much for being a guest on this program what a what a it was informative it was uh, absolute delight and just just fascinating on every level I, and i have a feeling people are very glad to be having you uh speak out on the ufo uap subject as well so well, very much needed. Thanks. thanks so much for having me and uh the thoughtful questions really interesting and it's uh, uh yeah let's let's see where uh where this is going i think there will be a lot of stuff happening in, the, in this year and if i can contribute just a little bit to uh, uh getting rid of the stigma then uh, all for the better yeah for sure well, and I want to thank everyone for uh, for being here as well with us. As always, uh, I, I personally appreciate your support. Uh, if you like this video, please do like it. Please do share it. You may subscribe to the channel. By all means, let's do all of that. And if you like what I do, you can go to Richard Olin Members, which is 
where most of my action takes place these days. Uh, we have a very active community of amazing people who are members of that website also. So that's all I've got. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank my guest, Christian Van Heist. And I'll catch you all again soon. Meanwhile, let's keep fighting the good fight. Later.